Strauss's interpretation of Nietzsche revolves around the persistent themes of his political philosophy, the critique of historicism, and the attempt to reopen the question of natural right. In Strauss's account of historicism, Nietzsche occupies a unique and interesting position between the theoretical historicism of the 19th century and the radical historicism or existentialism of the 20th. Strauss specifies this position at the outset of his lectures. Nietzsche began, he says, from the 19th century historicist premise that all thought and right are essentially rat and radically historical. Nietzsche, however, found this, uh, uh, found this view to be problematic uh, because of its detrimental effects on life. And of course, Strauss uh, recurs to the uses and disadvantages of the history essay to, to, to uh, draw out that, uh, that problem that Nietzsche sees with 19th century historicism. All of this led Nietzsche, according to Strauss, to quote, try to return from history to nature, and again, quote, to embark on an enterprise aiming at the restoration of nature as an ethically guiding concept. While this effort to return to nature was criticized by existentialists as a relapse into metaphysics for Strauss, it is what makes Nietzsche such a fruitful thinker to study. In the enterprise of returning to or restoring nature, Strauss sees Nietzsche's doctrine of the eternal return playing a central role. Therefore, he spends a great deal of time uh, in his lectures trying to decipher and uncover the motivation behind this doctrine. He rightly sees it as a moral rather than as a common cosmological doctrine. More specifically and distinctively, he interprets the eternal return as a response to the modern conquest of nature, for which nature is understood to be infinitely moldable uh, and for which there are no assignable limits. The end result of this scientific conquest of nature is the destruction of inequality, leading to Nietzsche's last man. Uh, by the way, with respect to this uh, modern project of conquering nature, the now largely forgotten political scientist uh, Harold Glasswell comes in for some fairly harsh and, uh, and actually hilarious criticism. Uh, apparently for Glasswell, in his kind of technocratic vision of things, uh, psychoanalysis was the uh, queen of, uh, of the te technocracy. And uh, in that regard, Strauss uh, adduces uh, an advertisement uh, from the day uh, the days of, in which he's uh, speaking, uh, that had a picture of Cesare Borgia uh, uh, for a pharmaceutical ad. Uh, and the idea was that uh, if Cesare had not had taken some of these pills, uh, he would have been much better off. And uh, Strauss uh, comments that, uh, yeah, but if he had taken those pills, he would not have accomplished many of the things Machiavelli wanted to, um, to accomplish. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, in the light of this uh, scientific project of the conquest of nature, uh, Nietzsche believes that, uh, or at least uh, Strauss describes to Nietzsche the, the notion that human greatness uh, ultimately would be un impossible under its dispensation. Human greatness for Nietzsche ultimately rests on the maintenance of difference between the sexes, for example, on inequality, on natural hierarchy, and on suffering. Um, and uh, for this reason, Nietzsche needs nature. Uh, this is a phrase that Strauss repeats throughout these lectures. Nature, uh, Nietzsche, uh, for, for all that in some ways is uh, inimical to nature, which emphasizes the overcoming of nature in Nietzsche, in the last analysis, he needs it. Uh, and this, uh, uh, but because the, uh, Nietzsche's doctrine of the will to power is incompatible, with traditional understandings of nature, nature for Nietzsche must be willed. And this is a kind of paradox that he, he again uh, plays with throughout the lectures, that nature needs nature, but nature is not something that can be simply there. It must be postulated or willed. This is the main significance of the term return, uh, according to Strauss. And he is particularly critical 
of Heidegger's interpretation of the eternal return because it overlooks this crucial motive behind the doctrine. Um, for this reason, this leads Heidegger to reject uh, uh, eternity altogether. And for this reason, Strauss regards Nietzsche as superior to Heidegger in the same way that he regards Nietzsche as superior to Marx. Unlike both of these thinkers, uh, Strauss says, Nietzsche is aware that nothing which is not eternal can satisfy a thinking man. In connection with Strauss's interpretation of the motive behind Nietzsche's doctrine of the eternal return, I can't resist mentioning a funny moment at the end of the lectures uh, when a student asks Strauss, why is the doctrine of eternal return so necessary to Nietzsche? Having spent about half the course on precisely this question, one can only imagine the sinking feeling Strauss must have felt at this question. Those of you who teach uh, may have experienced the sinking feeling uh, at one point or another in your careers. It is a testament to Strauss's patience as a teacher that after gently stating, we have already discussed this, he went on to explain the motivation behind the significance of the doctrine uh, of the eternal return one more time. So, what are we to make of Strauss's interpretation of the eternal return? I have to confess, I'm not sure this, his interpretation makes this strange doctrine any more intelligible or convincing than the myriad other interpretations that have been offered of it. Uh, indeed, Strauss's interpretation often makes the eternal return look like a fantastical contrivance designed to accomplish a moral political purpose, rather than as a logical outgrowth of Nietzsche's concept of the will to power and its affirmation of creativity and the eternal becoming. What is admirable about Strauss's interpretation is that he tries to make this strange doctrine uh, intelligible and motivated. I'm just not sure he succeeds. 